Imagine how different your life could be in a year if you committed to getting 1% better every day. This is the show dedicated to helping you improve your mindset, language, and behavior. Inspiring stories, practical advice, and damn good conversations. Here's your host, Joe Ferraro. I, I think there's a big piece to getting outside of your comfort zone, man. And um, you exemplify yeah. that in so many different ways. So full disclosure for the people listening at home um, and on YouTube, we bumped this up an hour and a half because our schedules felt like this might be a time. Now, I'll be honest with you, in the past, I would have probably needed a massage. I probably would have made sure that my notes are completely perfect. I would have made <laughs> sure that I had a better sweatshirt on. But but you and a lot of other people taught me that that, that shit doesn't matter. An authentic conversation is up here and how nice this shirt is, is down there. Can you think of a moment where you learned that lesson and, and how can we speed that learning curve up for people? Man, uh, I'll, this doesn't have to do with me per se, but someone just asked me a question yesterday and I think uh, it, it parlays really well into this. And for whatever it's worth, I don't know if I use the word parlay in the correct form. Yeah, it's either, there, so it's either just... a gambling addiction or exactly as you said it, so absolutely. Oh, wow. All right, that's very lucky because as I said it, I was like, I don't know if I'm using this word right. But um, yesterday, uh, a woman asked me because I've been doing jujitsu for a little over a year now, and I've, I've fallen in love with it. And a woman asked me, she's like, you know, watching you do it and hearing you talk about it, it's made me want to try it. So I'm really interested in it, but I have about 50 pounds to lose. So do you think I should lose the weight first and then? try jujitsu or should I just start now? And I hear this all the time. I, I heard this with powerlifting for years. You know, I feel like I'm not strong enough yet. Should I wait to compete? And, and it's always been something that's really interesting to me. I don't care if it's starting jujitsu. I don't care if it's powerlifting. I don't care if it's running a 5k. It's, it's sort of interesting. You never hear someone say like, oh no, like, uh, I'm not ready to run this charity 5k yet. Right. It's like, no, it's like, you're, it's, it's as, as soon as it's something where it's a competition, that's where people get really in their head. Like, well, I'm not ready for it yet. It's like, you're always ready for it because the reality is it's you versus you in any, it's always you versus you. you. It becomes an issue when you start thinking about how you'll stack up to other people who are doing it. When you start being worried about what other people will think about you, when you start getting worried about, about how you're going to do compared to someone who's been doing it for a year, five years, 10 years, 20 years, it doesn't matter how anyone else does. All that matters is how you do. And as long as you're getting better and as long as you're improving, that's the most important part. So whether it's putting on a nicer shirt for the for the podcast or whether it's starting jujitsu or or starting your own business or starting your own whatever it is, you're always you're always ready right now. It's never going to be as good as you'll want it to be. Even when you've been doing it for 20 years, it's never going to be as good as you want it to be. There'll always be room for improvement. But right now is always the best time to start. Always. I had uh, professional headshots taken the other day, and I'm 43 years old, and I've liked probably 5% of pictures ever taken of me. I like these pictures better than my wedding photos from 2008. You know, so there's wow. something to be said for that, right? Like, so uh, you're not going to be ready, right? That was the biggest day of my life. That was the day everything had to be perfect. And, um, and now all these years later, I'm not any better looking. Some would argue far worse looking. So, <laughs> what, what is your get your best guess at what changes? Is it a mindset shift that happens? Is it maturity? Is it something else? It change in what sense to make us view ourselves differently? Yeah, I think like you know, it seems like I just want to throw it in this bucket of being more comfortable in my own skin, and and your message yeah. is right aligned with that. You know, I think I think it's interesting. Um, I don't think it has to do with age or maturity because I know many people who as they age or as they get more mature, whatever that means, they are still very insecure. They still are not very confident in themselves. What the trend that I've noticed is the people who get more and more confident in who they are now are the people who take more risks and the people who put themselves in comfortable situations and, and who, who are okay being uncomfortable. Uh, I've seen 
the majority of people who I see who are not okay with who they are now consistently look back in time and say, oh, if I could look like I did then, or oh, back then, those were, it's all the people who are like, those were the days, like those were the best years of my life. They always look back, but if they actually went back to those time and asked themselves back in time how happy they were, they still weren't happy. They were still insecure. They, they were still worried. They have this idea, this grandiose idea of what the past was like. And they never realize that presently they're never living in a happy or in a, in a good frame of mind. And I think the, the consistent trait that I see among people who are living in a, a better frame of mind and in a more confident place are the ones who are okay being uncomfortable, who put themselves in situations in which they could lose. And they put themselves in situations in which they're going to be nervous or anxious and there could be a failure component to it. But it's overcoming that that I think allows you to have much more perspective and be okay with it as you get older. Recording this in late December 2020, if you look at your life currently on a scale of one to 10, with the rubric being straight up happiness, where's Jordan Syatt today, one through 10 on happiness? Say a nine, say, say uh, I'm, and if you had asked me six months ago, I think I probably would have said maybe a, a four or a five. Wow. Um, a couple of things have played a big role in that. It, realistically, my life, the day-to-day -day actions of my life haven't changed very much. The, the schedule has been almost exactly the same. Um, number one, I started seeing a therapist about five months ago, and that's been huge uh, in terms of, I, I was struggling with serious anxiety and I was struggling with a lot of anxiety that was, that was, had to do with social media and business. But what I didn't realize was that I was making it all up in my head. Like all my anxiety, it, it's for legitimate reasons, but those legitimate reasons I made up, like they weren't actually happening. It was, it was nothing that I was actually struggling with. It was nothing that I was actually going through. It was all made up scenarios in my head that were giving me anxiety. So there were legitimate reasons, but they were all made up legitimate reasons. And I think through the process of going through therapy and also, and I'm still doing it, still a big fan of it. Um, and also a lot of self-reflection on my own I have much more perspective for what I actually have, which has led to significantly more happiness. Literally just maybe 45 minutes to an hour ago, I was getting a workout in. And I'd say six months ago, if I was getting a workout in, so much of the workout, I would be focused on what I had to do, what I hadn't done so far, uh, what people were thinking of what I was doing, my work, like all this stuff. It was all like projections in regard to what people might think about me or what might happen to me in the future. Whereas an hour ago, I remember in the middle of the workout, I was just like very grateful for what I have right now in this moment. And it was a big, it was a big shift. I, I made note that the difference between how I approach my workouts now versus how I did six months ago. And um, I think a lot of it just has to do with being able to be, be aware of what I actually have going on in this moment. So today I, I'm in a really good spot. That's great to hear, man. Um, it's been awesome staying in touch with you since our first conversation and you've been so kind and supportive Let's go granular. So you're doing some exercises that are pretty difficult. Like, I don't even know what a Bulgarian split squat is, <laughs> but I know you like it or something from Bulgaria in the fitness realm. When you're doing that exercise, are you saying to me that it actually, while it's hurting, not, not an injury, but while it's really sucking, are you saying you're, you've been able to access some kind of mechanism where you're like, the fact that I can do this is awesome or I'm sweating and I'm alive and it's awesome. Is that how mental you're getting with it? That's, I think that's one aspect of it for sure. I think more of it in regard to what I was specifically speaking about was, I would say six months ago, and listen, I've been lifting for years. I've been lifting for like 20 years now. Um, and I've been through many phases of my lifting. What I think was going on about six months ago is I was just in a very, anxious frame of mind. And if you think about anxiety, anxiety is you're always worrying about something in the future. You're thinking about something in the future that you can't really control. And a lot of times you make it up in your head. So a lot of my workouts were spent feeling guilty because I was working out instead of being productive, right? And I put productive in quotes. It's like, instead of making content on social media, instead of doing things for my inner circle, instead of other things that would be more productive, I would say from a business slash financial perspective, right? And I would get anxiety about that. 
and I couldn't enjoy my workout because that's all I was focused on. Whereas today, I'm actually able to enjoy the workout. I'm actually able to be present in the workout. And I view that workout as productive. I view me being able to be happy and in a good mood and focused on the workout in that time. That is productive. Just because I'm not making content on social media, just because I'm not interacting with other people, just because I'm not finding perfect hashtags for my posts, whatever it is, just because I'm not doing that doesn't mean I'm not being productive. And, and I think one of the biggest things that I've learned over the last, last few months is that in order to be the most productive in, in business, you also have to have a certain level of productivity in your own personal, mental, and emotional health. And I was neglecting that so much that it was actually negatively impacting my own business. So by taking a step back from my business to focus on me and my own health, I've actually been able to help grow my business. Everybody has a different situation with COVID and how it's affected their business. Um, what, what has been the major learnings you've done with a, the fitness business during COVID? Uh, there's a lot. So I'll, when, it, when it all first started, I would say, in, in at least in, in America, um, in around March, when things became very real for us and lockdown happened and uh, my business took a pretty substantial hit. Like I think almost everybody is dead because people were nervous. They didn't know what was going on. So a lot of people canceled. Um, there was a brief period, I'd say a week or two where I was very nervous and I was worried like, well, this could, this could seriously negatively impact me. Um, I made a pretty quick turnaround in which most of my content prior to that, especially my fitness and exercise content had been geared towards people who had access to gym equipment. And, and actually I had, I had, I didn't push away people who didn't have access to it, but it wasn't my main focus, right? Because generally speaking, people who, who were only doing bodyweight workouts, it's a, it's a specific niche within the fitness industry that there are people who are professionals in that niche and that's their specialty. My specialty is more geared towards either powerlifting or weightlifting in general, whether you have dumbbells, kettlebells, barbells, doesn't matter, but that's where I'm generally more passionate and what I care about, what I focus on. But I made a pretty sharp turn uh, at that point in order to accommodate for the vast majority of people not having access to gym equipment. So uh, a large part of what I did was I, I pivoted to account for that people working out from home. And that helped a lot, not just didn't just help my business. It actually helped thousands of people be able to stay fit and work out from home. Um, and I also pivoted my nutrition content to take into account. And I think this is a huge part of it. So much of my nutrition content is geared towards the, the mental and emotional side, the psychological side of things the struggles that people have mentally and emotionally with food, not just, you know, this is a calorie, this is a carb. It's like, no, it's like, okay, you're not hungry, but you're still emotionally eating. Why is that going on? And when people are stuck at home and they might've lost their job and they have two or three kids in the house and they're homeschooling them, there's a lot of, of extra pent up emotions going on. So a, a huge portion of my content and business pivoted to help people deal with that. Mm. You're helping so many people. You can find so much more at sciatfitness.com. I can tell you firsthand, Jordan, that there's two former student athletes of mine who have lost upwards of 50 pounds and uh, they credit me for introducing them to you. <laughs> That's amazing. That's I, And if they're listening, congratulations to both of you. That's incredible. It's unreal. And um, isn't there something to be said for that, that you came into my life, I handed off to them my former players, and they, they look at someone like you as a celebrity. I mean, I know you bring a blush at that, that term, but they do, you know, I, and I, I know at least one of them has messaged you and you've written back. Uh, it's amazing, because I've seen your thumb scrolls, man, and they go on for hours. So <laughs> it's, it's not really a, a beautiful question. It's more of like, shoot, that is, uh, that's something. That is something that that's happening. It's, it's amazing. It's one of the reasons I, I love social media, right? I think so much of what we hear about social media is negative. Social media is it's, it's, uh, infiltrating our minds and our lives and it's terrible. And, and there are definitely negative aspects of it. And to, to that point, social media was a large part of the reason why I was getting anxiety. That being said, I think there is so much good and positive that comes with it. And uh, I think it's, a, it's a, overall a net blessing in our lives if we use it properly. I was going to ask you about your relationship to Instagram, and I'll connect it to your actual relationship. Uh, overdue, congratulations on the engagement. Thank uh, you. Thank you so much. And uh, for anyone who follows you on Instagram, and it's a lot of us, 
Um, they know that the camera and your fiance, nameless, but but still is a part of your life on social media. So mm. what I'm seeing when I look at those videos is a relationship, at least some aspect of it, and a business merging together. And I wonder if you've ever had moments where you're thinking, is this messy? Is this exactly as I want it? If I could snap my fingers and do it differently, would I do it differently? How do you think about the relationship between those pieces of the puzzle living on social media to some degree? Yeah, it's it's tough, man. It's, it's very tough. Um, I would say I think the way that I'm doing it right now is is how I would I would say right now is I think how I feel the most comfortable doing it is probably the best way to put it. Um, I know there are some people who have who are in relationships have big social media audiences and they give way more information than I do about themselves. Like they like for I keep my fiance's name and Instagram handle private people. I don't say what her job is. I don't I don't give too much information out. And this is after conversations with her about it asking like, do you want me to tag you? Do you want me to say what your name is? Do you want me to say what you do for work? And her being like, I'd rather not. Because having 700,000 people go in and click on your profile or see who you are or message you, whatever, like it's, it's invasive and it can be scary and you never know who's there, right? So that was largely her decision. Um, I know some people get really deeply involved with their significant other. They put them online, they share their stuff and they're totally fine with it. Part of me would like to be able to do that. Part of me, I, I see other people doing it, and there's part of me that's, that would, thinks it would be really great to be more open and more, uh, and more freely sharing of, of who we are in our relationship and all of that. The, that's the idealistic side of me. The realistic side of me knows that would be a very poor decision because, I mean, I've tried making vlogs. Like, I've tried making content just about me and about my life that has very little to do with fitness, and I hated it. I hate doing, like, a reality show type of thing where it's like, hey, guys, this is my life, and, and trying to make my life seem more interesting than it really is. I hate that. I, for me, my favorite type of content is educational content. Let me help you in some way. And the more I've done that over the years, the more interested in me people have become. They want to know more about me and my life and how I grew up and who I'm going to get married to, all this stuff. But I'm not a reality TV star. I hate that stuff. And I, I have friends who do that type of blogging, who make that type of content. And I see what they have to do in order to make that content on a regular basis. And it looks terrible. Like you just it just looks terrible. They always have their camera on them. They can't do, they have to run through normal daily activities 17 times to get the best shot. Right. And it's, it's just not interesting to me in the least. The finished product looks amazing, right? The finished product of the video, the YouTube video, the Instagram story, whatever, it looks really, really cool. And that's the idealistic side of me. I'd love to have that, but realistically, I know how many hours went into you making this video of you going into the refrigerator and getting out your meal. And that has no interest to me whatsoever. So yeah, I, I definitely struggle with it. But I think what I'm doing right now, I, I have, I have the best balance. But I still struggle with it. One of the thrills of the show is that sometimes people will find my guests' work for the first time, right? Obviously, your audience comes with you, which is awesome. We welcome them, and then my audience will say, "Oh man, who? Let's check this guy out." And when they go to watch your Instagram stories, they're going to see the sweetest woman in the world eating a salad. <laughs> and they're going to see you from like a low angle zooming in on the salad, right? That zoom cut. And they're going to go, dude, the guy said it wasn't a reality show. Now, <laughs> is what you mean that you're not editing it and you're just kind of clowning with this with this beautiful person? It's funny. All Like last night, I took a quick video of her. I, I poured myself some whiskey. We had some wine. I saw that. I saw that. And I took it and she saw the video and she was like, can we redo it? And I said, absolutely not. Because <laughs> like, then I know if I redo it, she's going to pose and she's going to try it. It's like, no, this is it. This is us. This is it. This is what it's not just because that what that's what I think good content is. That's also because people watching it's if people only see you when you're looking your best and you're posing, it's not real. And it does it does negative things to their mindset. And uh, and personally, I think. My fiance is way more beautiful when I catch her off guard versus when she's trying to pose for other people looking. So um, what you'll notice is very, I think more vlogs, reality TV shows, you, you get much more in depth, you get much more involved with the person. For me, 
most of what I do on Instagram, whether it's Q and A's, whether it's stories, whether it's the feed, I'd say 98% of it is all education, like all an education based around the very narrow field of what I consider myself an expert in. I'm not going off. And I mean, I see other people in the fitness industry talking about, I don't know, coronavirus and the vaccine and politics. And I'm like, I'm not talking about all that. So like I am, there's no way in hell I'm going to give you my opinion on any of this stuff. Not only am I not an expert on any of it, but I don't want to deal with your opinions on it either. So I'm going to stick to what I know. And that's literally it. And I'll occasionally show you me at jujitsu or I'll occasionally show you my fiance when we're eating and show you the food that we're having, but we're not going to sit down and invite you into this like private at home discussion. Like just that's just, I'm not comfortable with that at all. You know, what's funny about that whiskey shot. I, I felt strangely closer to you when I saw that because I was like, Jordan Syatt drinks whiskey. And it's weird because you've been transparent about cheat days versus eating um, in moderation, less of what you like. Um, but there's something that happened when I'm watching that. I'm like, he's pouring Buffalo Trace. I like Buffalo Trace. Um, and he's a fitness guy drinking whiskey. So for people that that are, are fairly new to your content, um, I'm curious, just, just give that thesis about you're not buying into the cheat days all the time as much for you as it is in moderation of what you love. Yeah, I've when I was younger and just getting into fitness, I, I fell for the hype around cheat days. It's like, you're super, super strict. You're very rigid. It's like you, you eat super clean throughout the week. And then you have one cheat day where you can have as much as you want. And, and for some people, for, for some people that can work for me and for the vast majority of my clients, it's a terrible, terrible idea. Uh, for me, I'm much more a proponent of, I'd rather be able to enjoy my favorite foods in moderation throughout the week rather than restrict, 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 only feel like I can have quote unquote good foods during the week. And then on the weekend, I can have one day to eat all the bad foods that I want. I think it creates a very disordered relationship with food. I think it creates this idea, this, this false idea of good and bad foods. Because what will happen is usually when you have this cheat day where you can have all the bad foods, usually the, the first bite, couple bites, maybe the first meal is great. But after that, you feel terrible. You feel nauseous, you feel sick, you're stuffing yourself just because you know the next day starts, you have to be clean again. So you're eating more than you're comfortable eating simply because you can, simply because you know you're going to start starving yourself as soon as the next day begins. And for me, that's not a healthy relationship with food. I, I think a healthy relationship with food is if on a random Tuesday night, you and your wife decide to go out to dinner, you can enjoy some French fries and maybe some chocolate cake with her without feeling guilty and then get back on track the next day and fall right back into your normal routine, not restricting yourself because you, you fucked up the night before, but because you enjoyed yourself, you're back on track and that's it. That's a healthy relationship with food for me. I think anybody who feels like they can only eat clean foods all the time has an unhealthy relationship with food. And I think someone who, who feels like uh, they, they can eat all the junk that they want as long as it fits in their macros all the time also has an unhealthy relationship with food. It's a balance of both worlds that I think is where you're going to get the, the most healthy and that have the best relationship with food. Let's stay on the thread with alcohol for a moment. Um, this is going to find people after the new year, but not immediately. I probably released this in February when people now have either given up on their fitness habits, <laughs> or need to re-understand what the relationship is. What's the simplest way, not the best way necessarily, but the simplest way for someone who doesn't have a dependency on alcohol necessarily, but a lot of people drinking more during quarantine. What's the formula that's simplest for healthy social drinking while remaining fit or committed to a healthy lifestyle? This is a great question. Uh, and I, I wish there was a, I'll, I'll say this. I'll, I'll start by saying a lot of people ask, is it okay to drink alcohol while you're losing fat? Right? Like, is that okay? The, the short answer is yes, it absolutely is okay. Um, I think it becomes an issue when, and this is going to be like bullet points, right? Like, I think it becomes an issue when you drink so much alcohol that you can't wake up and feel good. Like you're waking up, you're hungover. You can't wake up without, you, you can't go work out because you feel so shitty, right? Like that's a major issue. That's going to negatively affect your, your goals, your fitness, your health, your performance, not because it's the alcohol, but because you drank too much, right? And if you do that, once a month, once every couple of months, no big deal. If you do that once a week, a couple times a week, a few times a week, that's when it becomes a big problem. Another issue is I've often found it's rarely the alcohol that is making it, uh, I've, I've rarely found it's the alcohol that's making people fat, just to put it bluntly. 
usually what's going on is people are drinking and after they drink and they're drunk, then they're getting the pizza and then they're getting the ice cream and then they're having a whole box of cereal when they get home. And then it's all the food they drink after they, they were drinking. Or it could be the, like when they're at the bar, they have the salty, the nuts and the pretzels and all this, the wings and all that other stuff. They go to Buffalo Wild Wings, they get a calzone from DP dough, whatever it is, right? It's like, that's what leads to the weight gain. It's not the alcohol. It's the, it's what you're doing after you drink or during you drink. So I think the right way or the best way or the simplest way we could call it is if you want to have a couple of drinks throughout the week, it's totally fine. The thing about drinking responsibly, and I hate saying that phrase drinking responsibly because I sound like I'm preaching. I'm not, I'm not preaching. Like if you want to get drunk, by all means get drunk. But the thing about drinking responsibly is that you can have a few drinks without it completely destroying you. Like I remember when I was younger and I first started drinking, like in high school, like I would drink to get destroyed. That was the purpose of drinking. There was no reason to drink unless you were just going to be completely plastered. As I've gotten older and as I've learned how to be more responsible with drinking, it's like I drink to enjoy my time with whoever I'm with as a, as a because I like what I'm drinking, because I enjoy it. If it gets taken too far, that's no longer enjoyable. And if that's happening on a regular basis, that's when it's really going to affect your health and performance. One more question on alcohol as way of, of shining a light on a bigger issue. If you were coaching a client and they and they have these conversations with you, how do you approach the the mindset and, and practice of things like, well, if I go Coke and rum, I'm going to do diet. If I go liquor, it's got to be vodka. We're going to take away the sugary stuff and then white wines less than like it. There becomes this lifestyle again where now it's like you have to make bargains with yourself. Is that the right way to think about it as you approach a client and talking about these ideas? Yeah, I, I think it's no different than setting a budget for yourself, right? It's like, okay, cool. So you want to live in this house. Okay, so the, the rent or the mortgage is going to be this much this much per month. Okay, so cool. So that means you're going to have to give this up here. You're going to have to make sure you're spending less here. If you want to have an Audi, cool, an Audi is a really nice car. That means that maybe you're not going to have a, as nice of a house. You're not going to be able to have a house with as much rent or a big, as much of a mortgage, right? If you're going to spend this much on drinks every week on like money, if you're going to go out and you're going to spend three nights a week, you're going to spend over a hundred dollars on drinks. You have to adjust your budget to make sure that you're not going into debt, that you're not, you're spent, not spending all your money. Same thing with calories, right? It's like, cool. You want to go out and you want to drink. you like, if you're going to tell me you're going to have five drinks that night, well, then you're probably, if you're going to have rum and Coke, maybe you make it rum and diet Coke. If you tell me you're going to have one drink, go for it. Rum and Coke, no problem. It's not a big deal. It's one drink, but it's, you're budgeting it. And that's really all it is. So for me, if I'm working with a client, I think the difference is I'm not telling them what to do. It's really, it becomes a conversation. So if I have a client who's like, hey, I'm going out, to, I'm going out, I'm definitely going to have some drinks. What do you think I should do? I'm always going to turn around. I'm like, well, what, what do you think you should do? And if they say, all right, fine, I, I won't go out to drink. I say, no, 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 that's not the right answer. I want you to go out want you to have fun. Tell me what, what drinks do you think you're going to get? How many drinks do you think you're going to have? Now they start talking about it and they start planning it just like they would plan a budget. Okay, I know I'm going to go on vacation. I'm going to spend this much money on vacation. The flights are this. The hotel is this. Cool. You're going to go out to eat. What are you going to eat before you go out? Are you going to have a salad with your chin on top before you go out so you have some more leeway with your calories? Or are you going to like? Are you going to have like uh, donuts from Dunkin' Donuts beforehand? Are you going to get some pizza beforehand? And then you're like, you eat all your calories before you even go out. It's all just about planning. So for me in the conversation, so what do you think you're going to drink? I don't know. Like I really like rum and Coke. Okay. So how many rum and Cokes are you going to have? Five. Okay. Do you, do you think you'd rather have five rum and Cokes, regular Coke, or do you think you'd rather have like one or two rum and regular Cokes or would you substitute with maybe you have three with diet Coke, one with regular Coke? How are you going to do this? And then, then they can start to plan and they can learn how to create their own calorie budget and start to learn how to become a flexible dieter rather than me just saying, this is what you need to do. Yeah, that makes sense. How's your uh, how's your podcast going? Podcast is great, man. I'm loving it. I'm really, really enjoying it. It's tough. Um, I love conversations like this. Like, I really enjoy having conversations with other people. I've recently started doing some podcasts where I just talk by myself. Those are really difficult for me. Um, for what it's sort of in the same reason why it's difficult for me to do vlogs, like a reality TV show, because it's it's just difficult for me just to talk about myself. Like I'm not the biggest fan of that, but those have, have gotten a great response. I really enjoyed it. We just passed, uh, we just passed 2.5 million downloads, which is great. So, uh, yeah, I'm having fun with it. That's, that's fantastic. You know, it's, it's, I've, been, I've talked to people about this when they feel uncomfortable in the solo, 
on one hand, that's that's the key to keep doing it, right? I've made my workflow conversation this week. Next week, I'll do kind of a, an audio essay, and it's kept me sharp that way. But the non-conversation episodes take twice or three times as long because you're yeah. trying to take a take. One thing to think about is to have someone there who's just throwing questions at you every once in a while, but still you're talking 90% of the time. I like that. It's funny. The hardest part for me about the solo episodes is the, is the introduction. Very similar to, to YouTube videos where it's like when you're just introducing what's going to happen, you become hyper aware of what you're saying and how you're speaking. And maybe you have like one little misstep with like you say a word slightly incorrectly. And in your head, you feel like you just completely mumbled over it. And people are going to be like, what the hell is he drunk? Like, what is that? But then you listen to it back and it sounded totally fine. Like, so you're very hyper critical of what you're doing and what you're saying. Once I get past the, the five to seven minute mark, I'm good. I'll, I'll roll with it. But that introduction sequence is the most difficult. I do like the idea of having someone just throwing out questions because I love Q and A. Q and A I can do all day. I love that. You know, that's something to think about. I mean, with the amount of response you get on on Instagram with Q and A, um, some of the most successful podcasters I listen to just have an every so often Q and A. And I know you do some of that. Mm. But for you, the amount of questions that come in is is big time. Um, if someone was listening to your podcast for the first time. Um, I always tell people, do not go in chronological order. Don't go back <laughs> to episode one and hear my mistakes. Is there an episode that you've done recently that you'd love to direct people to? Um, you know, I'd say the most recently published one as of right now is it's titled How to Build a Healthier Relationship with Food, Jose's Story. And this is a conversation I had with one of my inner circle members, Jose, grew up in Mexico, uh, and he was – I, I love having conversations with people who have struggled with their relationship with food and who are very open and honest about it. I'd say 90% of the conversations I have with people who struggle with food are women. And there are many, many of those on my podcast to have a male come out and talk about it is not usual. Men tend to be much more. Uh, it's funny. If you look in the research, it shows that women tend to have more disordered relationships with food than men. But through working with both men and women for years, I found that it's more of a 50, 50 split. It's just men are less likely to talk about it. Right. It's like men are less likely to actually come forward and say, hey, I'm really struggling with binge eating. I'm struggling with food. I'm struggling with bulimia. Um, so that episode was remarkable. And I would very much encourage anyone, man, man or woman, to listen to that. I'm going to listen to that on the way home because uh, I'm going to hit you with another one of those stories right now. One of the things I really wanted to talk to you about today was something that I've been thinking about since we decided to do a second round. Um, one of the loves of my life is my 10 year old son. I have a, a daughter, Charlie, and a, and a son, Joey. Joey's 10, unbelievably uh, cerebral kid, creative kid, not interested in athletics at all like mom, like dad was, and like his, his, his sister is. Dad loves to be creative and, and, that, and not so active anymore. <laughs> Joey, not so active right now. Mm -hmm. He's begun to get to that age, Jordan, where he's now saying these sweatpants don't fit as well as they used to. I've noticed my belly's a little bigger than I want it to be. And, uh, and I want to be transparent because I have big time conversations with him. So he'll listen to this someday, no doubt about it. And I, I wonder if you would, how, how do you advise me, but really advise the people listening to not only have a conversation with myself, but with Joey, because my goodness, the last thing I want to do is add any degree of shame. Gorgeous kid, mm. not getting to the point where he's happy with how he looks. Mm -hmm. That's a delicate thing. And I, and I throw my, my personal story at you hopes that it could, it could help other people as well. Yeah, it, it, this is tough, man. It's, and forever it's worth, m my advice is gonna be coming from someone who doesn't have kids yet. So that's, I think it's worth sure. noting I haven't gone through this. That being said, I've worked with hundreds if not thousands of people who have kids and have gone through struggles like this. And I think it's really important not to have kids focus on their weight. I think it's a it's a big mistake that many parents make, especially my generation, slightly older than me. A lot of the people that I work with who struggle with body image and food, they always remember. There's always like one or two stories they remember of when their parents brought up their weight at a young age. And that was the moment that they started being overly obsessed with food and overly obsessed with their body. They were aware of it before, but it was that comment from their mother or father when they were young kids that sparked everything. So I'm very aware of that now. And I would I would say probably the best thing you could do is not to necessarily bring up his weight or to focus on his weight or his fat. I would say 
the best thing you could do is get him to focus on on his performance. And for whatever it's worth, I think this is this holds true for everybody, for regardless of age, adults, whatever it is. But especially as a kid, try to get him to really be involved in some type of, of movement athletics and make it fun, make it a challenge. Make sure you're involved with him. Maybe it's it could be running. Say, hey, let's see how fast we can run this quarter mile. Like, hey, like, like let's do this with me. Let's see how many push-ups we can get in the next hour. Whatever it is, like make challenges with him to see what he can do physically, performance-wise. Get him to see how how amazing his body is. And then after that, be like, all right, we just did we just did 50 push-ups. So what do we got? We got to make sure we get protein in. Why? Because that's what builds muscle. You want to get big and strong, we got to have some protein to build muscle. Here's a glass of milk. Here's some chicken breast, whatever it is. And what are we going to have? We're going to have vegetables. Why? Your body needs nutrients. If We don't want that workout. And like this, maybe you don't want to phrase it like you don't want that workout to go to waste. But if we want to get the most out of that workout, if we want to make that workout the most effective, we got to fuel ourselves properly. And then when you do it in this sense, he's going to be eating more fruits and vegetables. He's going to be eating more protein. He's going to be more focused on it because now he wants his body to improve in the sense of his performance as opposed to he wants to make his body smaller. He wants to lose body fat. He's going to restrict and restrict and restrict. I would much rather him focus on getting strong. And this works for girls too, young girls. But get them strong, get them fast, make them sprint, make them jump, make them move. Get them focused on what their body can do, not trying to get smaller and smaller and smaller and restrict, restrict, restrict. So going for, thank you so much. I mean, that's that's great stuff. It's, it's, it's potentially life-changing stuff. Obviously, I got to look at myself, right? There's no excuse for me not to get more... Um, movement oriented period full stop right i mean i kind of make a story in my head sometimes jordan where it's like i can't do it all and i know that's that's true and if i have creative ideas and i put out a podcast and i start a newsletter and i do these things i got to tell myself that doesn't excuse me from also having movement as a part of my life for him yeah. it's cartoonist he's an amazing artist so sometimes he's on the ipad sometimes he's drawing but trying to get him and then by proxy listeners who are adults doing the same thing to incorporate movement and to incorporate mobility. Yeah, you could even do things like if you're all watching TV, right? And I don't know how often that happens. TV is on. Every time the commercial comes on, jumping jacks. Every time a commercial comes on, let's see how let's, who can get more jumping jacks, who can get more push-ups. Like, all right, we're going to do stretches for this commercial break. Like you have something for the commercial where, number one, it's cool to do as a family unit. Number two, it, I love the competition aspect. The competition aspect, I mean, I, I don't know as much for young girls, but for young boys, especially, like, I just don't know as much about young girls, but I know for young boys, competition can be huge. It's like, we, hey, like, I want you to, ch this week during the, for the commercial breaks, like, you average this many push-ups. Next week, let's try and get at least five more push-ups, whatever it is. You got this many jumping jacks. Start keeping data track it like in the same way you track your workout strength you go to the gym cool i use 55s for a dumbbell bench press track his data like maybe you track his height in the kitchen right you get your kids height you rock with a marker you see how often they grow track their push-ups track their mile time track their quarter mile time see how many jump ropes they can get in a row fuck see how many pogo sticks they can get in a row you know it's like i remember being a kid when i got a pogo stick i wanted to get to a thousand i was out there for hours on the pogo stick trying to get to a thousand and i remember I was at like 990 something. My brother was like, Jordan, mom wants you. She's pissed. And I jumped off right before I got to a thousand. I'll never forget that. But having competition with them to also to take part in yourself, I think would be super helpful. How many times a day do you say or type the phrase calorie deficit? A lot, a lot. Uh, less recently, just because I've been posting less recently on social media, but I would say on an if I'm if I'm average posting one time a day, uh, in terms of speaking with clients or or Instagram Q and As or writing a caption or making a YouTube video, I mean, I'd say probably at least like 15, 15 to twenty now, and that's a low ball compared to when I was working with a lot of one on one clients. Like if I was working with seventy one on one clients at one point, and then I also had my inner circle, and I was also posting on Instagram three times a day, oh, that would be hundreds of times. It's almost an embarrassing question that I'm going to ask you, but like I think about calorie deficit and I say, uh, I intuitively understand it. And then if I look at it and I say, if I'm burning more calories than I'm taking in, mm -hmm. I have to admit to you, there's a psychological barrier. It's not huge, but it's there where I'm like, I'm not even close to that, but is that even healthy? Like there's actually that in my head where I'm like, how am I going to have energy? And my daughter actually has started asking about calories. So basic science lesson 101, like how am I gonna have enough energy to do the daily task and be creative 
if I'm burning so many calories. So do you mean from exercise, like burning so many calories from exercise? I think just overall, right? Like I'm saying like, you know, if I have a huge sandwich for lunch, yep, that's X amount of calories. And now I want to exercise to burn more than I just took in. Is my body relying on calories that have been sitting there for, for days? Like I'm almost going science 101 here. So, so this is actually, I'm glad you brought it up. And this is a very, um, I would say, I would call this a very detrimental way to think about fat loss, food, exercise. And I, this is why I sort of, I hate those memes where they're like, if you eat one Snickers bar, then you're going to have to run for this many hours to burn it off. I'm like, shut the fuck up. That's, that's <laughs> I've heard that one. I've heard that one. Stupid. If you have this many donuts, then you have to run 22 miles to burn it up. Shut the fuck up. No, stupid way to think about it. This is why I'm such a big fan of, I don't care how many calories you burn from exercise. A couple reasons. Number one is any tracker you have, Fitbit, um, I don't care if you're looking at the, the calorie counter on your, on your treadmill, elliptical, whatever, they're wrong. And people hate when I say this. They're wrong. Research shows upwards of 50% inaccurate. So if it shows that you burn 400, you probably only burn about 200 at most, and which is really annoying. Right? It's like, oh, fuck, I thought I was burning a lot of calories. And people are like, oh, you do that hot yoga class, you burn 900 calories. No, you didn't. You sat in the heat. And you think because you sweat a lot, you burn a lot of calories. Like you burned a few hundred maybe, but you didn't burn 900 calories. The issue here is then when they burn that many calories, they're like, oh, I can eat all these back now. And then they start eating more. And if the thing told them they burn 900, then they're going to eat at least 900 just because like, oh, I can eat all of that back. The reality is maybe you burned 350, maybe 400 at most. So you just ate back double what you just burned. So I don't like paying attention to what the calorie trackers tell you. The other thing is when it comes to fat loss, I, I just pay attention to how many calories you're taking. In, right? So if you use the calculation that I have from a calorie calculator on YouTube, whatever it is, you, it, it's going to tell you to have X number of calories. I don't want you to focus on exercise to burn calories. I want you to focus on exercise to get stronger. I want you to focus on exercise to improve your performance. A lot of people struggle with this when I say this. Like the, the purpose of exercise isn't to burn calories. The purpose of exercise is to get strong, to get athletic, to move better, to feel better. When you want, when you want to lose fat, the driver of fat loss is nutrition. Nutrition drives fat loss. Nutrition is the most important part, what you're putting in your body. When you're exercising properly, when you're exercising effectively, the purpose of it isn't to burn 5,000 calories. The purpose of it isn't to drive your body into the ground and feel like shit. The purpose of it is to make you feel better. The purpose of it is to get you to improve and to get stronger. So if you're in an appropriate calorie deficit through nutrition, it's only a couple hundred calories a day. It's not that much is you shouldn't be in such a huge caloric deficit through exercise that you feel awful you're tired you're lethargic your libido drops like that's not a good calorie deficit that's a very unsustainable unenjoyable calorie deficit the whole purpose of doing something sustainable is slight drop in calories so that you can still improve your performance in the gym you can still get stronger you can still lift more you can still be more athletic and lose body fat at the same time if your focus is to burn as many calories as possible you're going to be doing stupid shit like endless burpees and running for hours on end where i think you'd be better off doing some deadlifts and chin-ups and push-ups getting in and out sweat a little bit if you want but you don't have to and then fat loss comes from your nutrition Damn, Jordan. I, in my classroom, uh, virtual learning, when we when we have incredible points like that, I do the simplest thing. I go like this and <laughs> go freaking bananas. A bell ringing to signify an amazing moment has like changed my teaching. So that's come on that. the show. <laughs> that's come yeah. on the show. And, and it, dude, honestly, that was like, let me whisper this. That was like freaking life changing to me. It was so simple. But that was the first time I really heard it in a way that I understood it, man. And I think that's a big, big secret of your success, making it attainable. You're a teacher at heart. And um, I'm going to ask you just a couple more questions and let you bounce, man. I appreciate it. Um, what about your? Tell me about your core values in life when you think about how your work intersects with your life. What, what core values do you have that show up on a daily basis? Um, oh, man, this is a good one. I would say... I would say honesty is probably number one, right? I, I, in the fitness industry, especially, it's so easy to find people who are dishonest, right? In, in the fitness industry, it's easy to find people who are doing things, selling things just to make money, as opposed to doing things or selling things because they actually work and they're going to help people. Um, so yeah, I think honesty in, in what I do and what I promote and what I say is, is definitely 
if not, it's got, it's number one, it's gotta be number one. Um, for whatever it's worth, I think it would be dishonest of me not to say I've struggled with that. Like there, if you, there have been times in my career in which I was influenced by the wrong people and I was influenced by, I would say the wrong incentives. And I was, it was easy for me to justify being dishonest and it never felt good and I'm not proud of it, but it would be dishonest of me not to say that now. Right. And I think we've all made mistakes. Every single person has made mistakes and done things they're not proud of. But what makes me the, the happiest right now and what allows me to be, I think the, the best coach, the best business owner, the best fiance, the best partner, the best son is to understand that being honest, even if it might not be easy for you to say, especially if it's not easy for you to say is probably the most important part of your integrity and, and, and whatever you're trying to build. As corny as it sounds, I always talk about get to over have to. So uh, with that in mind, how much water do I get to drink every day? <laughs> this is a, it's a good question. It's, it's so odd to me how common this question is. Because to me, it, it's very simple. It's very basic. If you're thirsty, drink. Right? That's the number one. If you're thirsty, drink. If your pee starts to get a little bit dark or smell weird, drink. That's it. Like, that's really it. Some people, some people are like, you got to have a gallon a day. Some people are like, you got to drink this yeah. much every hour. It's like, listen, your body is very good and very smart at telling you when you need certain things. You know, like, you know when you need to sleep. You're, all right, tired, go to bed. Like, you know that. Even if, like, sometimes you'll fight it. You'll hold your phone right up in front of your face in bed. You'll scroll for, apps, scroll for hours, watch certain things. It'll get your heart rate up to make you not tired anymore. But Sun goes down, put the screen away, you get tired, you go to bed, get a good night's sleep, make sure that your phone's on do not disturb so no one's calling you and disrupting it. Easier said than done, but it's very simple, it's very basic. Drinking water, if you're thirsty, drink. If your pee is too dark, drink. For me, I like to say if you're hungry, drink first. Not because you're confused, not because your body's confused. Your body's not confused, you probably are hungry, but I think that's a good way to make sure you're getting enough water in every day. So. If you're thirsty, drink. If you're hungry, drink. If your pee starts to smell weird and it's dark, drink. That's it. Don't overthink it. If someone's like, you got to have a gallon of water every day, you have to have this much every five minutes, shut the fuck up. Thirsty, drink. Hungry, drink. Pee's weird, drink. Oh, my goodness. Um, <laughs> that's great stuff. Sciatfitness.com. Uh, you'll see a sense of humor along with the honesty. You'll see some education. I think we've given everyone a great portrait of this. Final question. Um, some people are big audiobook people. I know you're into the podcast world a little bit. Where are you at with your learning journey? I know you're a lifelong learner. Um, what's been getting under your skin recently? Have you been picking up something in books? Have you been reading fiction? What's something that that Jordan Syed uh, 2021 is into right now from a learning standpoint? Philosophy. Hmm. Philosophy has been. I was just talking to someone. I part of me wishes I was exposed to more philosophy in school as a young kid because. It, I feel like I would have really enjoyed it. The other part of me knows I was a complete and utter just, I was a, I was a cannonball in school and I pro, I don't know if I would have had the attention span to pay attention to it and actually listen and, and appreciate it. But lately I've been really getting deep into philosophy. Um, also philosophy mixed in with religion. I'm Jewish, but I've been studying, uh, I've been, I joined a, a Bible study. Like hmm. I, have, I have two friends who, who are Catholic and I, Every Wednesday we get on a Skype call and we do a, a little Bible study together because I think philosophy and religion mix in really well together. Uh, and it's really cool for me to, to compare the two, even if it's not my religion, I still think it's really interesting to learn about other religions and to, I think any religion, regardless of whether or not it's yours, is that there's always amazing lessons to be learned in there. So philosophy for me and religion, but I think philosophy recently has been huge. It's been challenging me like on many, many levels. And, um, for me, I think one of the most interesting aspects about philosophy, especially when you're looking at like ancient philosophers, old philosophers from hundreds and thousands of years ago, is they lived in a completely different world, like completely different world. They could not have imagined in their wildest dreams what the world would look like today. But the problems they discuss, the issues they bring up, the, the, the resolutions that they have, they all hold true today. Even in the, the most outrageously different world that we live in, 
everything they're saying still makes sense and everything they're saying still still holds true. And I think that's uh, remarkably interesting for me and one of the reasons I'm so invested in it because these are just, these are truths. And these are discussions that will always be difficult and always need to be had regardless of where humanity is. I would go to Instagram and find Jordan there. He's incredibly active, Q and A's at least a few times a week, answering a ton of them. Uh, go to the podcast everywhere you get your podcast. Jose's story is on my list. Jordan, I don't know who's counting, but from my vantage point, two damn good conversations between you and me on on One Percent Better, man. I truly appreciate you. Man, yeah, I appreciate you, and uh, and in my opinion, we should make this more frequent. We should do this on a more regular basis. So, Let's go. I I think it's been about a year since since you're, the last one. You're right, and I and I did you a service not releasing this shit right after New Year because I know how you hate that. Everyone books you right after the New Year. We got to. <laughs> little bit your content's good 12 months <laughs> i appreciate it man listen I, I i've said it before i'll say it again i i really appreciate you i think that you're fantastic at what you do i'd come on your podcast significantly more often so anytime you want me on i'll come on let's get that <laughs> going jordan i appreciate you uh, uh, jumping on early today man fantastic <laughs>